folks. I, Professor Young couldn't come today, <coughs> so uh, my name is Leslie Sinclair, and he asked me to come along and uh, start chapter 13 for you. Uh, I know Professor Young asked you to turn your cell phones off. Would you indulge me by putting them away, please? Thank you. Nice gentleman there in the front row. Thank you. I find them a dreadful distraction. All right. <clears throat> so I think you're aware uh, that Newton gave us this relationship. And uh, uh, you also know that you have spent the last eight lecture hours looking at the right-hand side of Newton's second law. That is, you've been looking at the motion of the particle, the kinematics of the particle, and there are various kinematic variables, one of which is the acceleration that goes on the right-hand side of Newton's second law. We are going to spend most of today uh, talking about some specific forces that go on the left-hand side of Newton's second law. But I want to do a couple of things first. Uh, and really what I'm going to do here is just remind you of a few things that you know. So here's one. So you don't know me very well. In fact, you don't know me at all. But I spend my life uh, writing on the board and erasing uh, the board. And I'm not much of an athlete, but if I exercise, I swim. I know. What's the point, right? The point is that I have very, very strong shoulders and upper arms. You know? Legs, not so much. Okay? So strong, le strong upper arms and shoulders. I'm going to take, did I mention they were strong? Yeah, okay. I'm going to go down and I'm going to grab my boot laces. And I'm going to exert a force on my boot laces. Okay? In the upward direction with the I mentioned the strong, right? The force in the upward direction. That's a vector in the upward direction. Why do I not accelerate towards the ceiling? What is pulling me? What is? Well, it's not a trick question in the sense that you know that I'm not going to accelerate towards the ceiling, right? So in that sense, it's not. It's not a trick question. So this answer is half right. This answer is half right. Something else is pulling me down. What? Yeah, you see, that's the wrong answer. Okay? This doesn't have anything to do with gravity, and hence, because of the strong. If you think it's gravity, it's because I'm not pulling hard enough. So now we go back to the strong arms, right? So that's actually not the correct answer. What is the correct answer as to why I don't accelerate towards the ceiling? Because I'm pulling up on my shoelaces, and the shoelaces are pulling back down, and that represents a pair of forces that are internal to the system. The left-hand side of Newton's second law is the sum of the forces that are external to the system. You think you drew free body diagrams for SIP 100? You're going to draw more for us. Question? Is there a question? If I did the same thing? The force of grab, well, uh, yes, if you did it in Mars, if you did it at Mars, it would be the same thing because the forces are internal to the system. Okay? All right. Some other things you know. I think, I think you know this one from high school. Let's look at a motion. Okay? Let's look at a motion and the force is on the particle. Okay, simple motion. How many forces are acting on the particle? Right now. Two. All right. Which two forces? The gravitational force is acting downward. And the, te and the tension. 
just, I, I don't use the word centrifugal or centripetal or whatever they are. Okay. Anyway. All right. There's gravity that acts on the bob, and there's the tension of the string, which is acting on the bob toward my hand. All right. So let's take those one at a time. So the force of gravity acts on the bob downward. Why is the bob not accelerating downward? It's not. OK, someone? Someone from high school. I think this is done in high school. Because there is, in fact, as I'm doing it now, a very small component of the tension that is in the vertical direction. I cannot make this uh, string go completely horizontal. Now, you can't see it right now, but you can see it now. This is a little bit like magic. Like this, is, uh, this is mother nature. This is Newton's second law operating. When I reduce the tension, the angle has got to change because that component of tension is balancing gravity in this configuration. You will be doing a problem where this is the demonstration for the problem. You'll be doing that next week, probably with Professor Young. All right, let's go back and look at the other force that is being exerted on the bob. So we've agreed that there's a tension that acts on the bob toward the center of the circle. Why isn't the bob accelerating towards my hand? I just heard the right answer. It is accelerating towards my hand. It is accelerating toward my hand. All right, <clears throat> so you knew all that. I know you did. Let us now start to look at specific forces that are of interest to us, okay? some basic forces. And we won't talk about acceleration at all. I'm going to say this to you now because I may not have a chance to say it to you later, although I am going to see you next Friday. I'm going to say this now anyway. Once you recognize, once you understand that the le there's a left-hand side and a right-hand side and that they are different, that these are forces and this is motion, once you understand that really thoroughly, this course gets easier. All right? I'll say that to my own students next week. All right, uh, so let's look at the left-hand side, and we're going to look at some specific forces, and it will come as no surprise to you that the first force of interest that, I, that, that I'm going to discuss is the force of gravity. So three forces. And the first one is the gravitational force of attraction. Newton gave us this one, too. Newton gave us this one, too. He gave us both the direction of the force and the magnitude of the force. Uh, it's a force which operates between any two masses in the universe, so in general, mass 1 and mass 2. This is the magnitude of the force where G is the gravitational constant and R is the distance between the centers of the masses. And we know that the force is going to operate along the line of the centers of the two masses. OK, so now I draw a picture like that. And then the question is, OK, in which direction does the force act? That diagram, when you have a spring, really gets bad. <coughs> okay, this is what, and again, I'm not going to talk about free body diagrams yet today, okay, or yet. Uh, probably on, uh, is your first class Monday or two? Anyway, what, your next class. Uh, and, 
And the, the thing is that when you draw a free body diagram, you are in fact isolating the mass. And so the force of attraction is acting in this direction on this mass. And the force of attraction is acting in that direction on the other mass. And a free body diagram is usually one mass. Well, you might have some broken up, but an individual free body diagram is one mass. How do the forces act on that mass? All right, so we know the direction of the force, and we know the magnitude. And I think you know that if we say that mass uh, one is just some random mass that's on the surface of the Earth, and we know, and then M2 becomes the Earth. And so the distance between uh, the two masses is, if you're close to the surface of the Earth, the distance between the two masses is essentially going to be the radius of the Earth. And so I'm not going to bother to write down G or RE or ME. But without knowing any of those numbers, without knowing the mass of the Earth, without knowing the gravitational constant, without knowing the radius of the Earth, what is the product GME over RE squared? 9.81. Okay, 9.81. So therefore, the magnitude of the force of gravitational attraction on an individual mass on the surface of the Earth is equal to 9.81 times m. Now this is where I'm going to uh, warn you to remove a phrase, a commonly used phrase, from your vocabulary. Where am I going to put it? I'm going to put it here. Don't use that phrase. I've heard it. I've heard it from engineers. A, a mass is, have you, have you used this phrase? A mass is subject to gravitational acceleration. Have you heard that? Ugh. You can't be subject to an acceleration. You're subject to a force. A force is exerted. The mass is subject to the force. The resulting motion is the acceleration. The resulting motion is reflected in the acceleration. OK? So this is a very, very confusing, confusing uh, uh, expression because it mixes up what should be a force with a motion term. So don't use it. Gravity is a force. It exerts on masses. It belongs on the left-hand side, not the right-hand side of Newton's second law. The other thing, too, is the only thing that actually accelerates at 9.81 meters per second squared is something that's dropped. Well, we don't study that, like because we know that. Right? So when we're dealing with a problem, there's almost always another force around. And so part of our problem is going to be in sorting out the sum of all those forces, one of which might be gravity. May well be gravity. So don't confuse uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Uh, let me, uh, oh, yes. So I just want to give you a little warning about, again, some vocabulary in your textbook, uh, partly because I, uh, I don't like this phrasing, but occasionally uh, your book and possibly even mastering uh, may give you the information about a mass in terms of its weight. And I don't use the word weight. I don't like the word weight. It confuses me. So, but occasionally you might see the weight is of some, of some uh, particle. Might be 10 newtons. 
What that means is that the mass of the particle is equal to 10 divided by 9.81 kilograms. And you should do that division uh, for your problem sets and your, don't use one, okay? We want you to actually carry out that division. All right, so that's just a little warning. Any questions? Okay, force number two. some board, so I'm just going to erase the board. I'll just be right back. You can relax your minds. Okay. I'm not going to talk at the board and pretend I'm not erasing it. force that is of interest, uh, friction, or with current weather conditions, the lack thereof. <laughs> I've got much better jokes than that one. Okay, I, so I do believe I do believe that you already know that there are two different kinds of friction, that there is kinetic friction, there's static friction, and I'm going to do kinetic friction first. And I'm going to do it primarily by way of example and remind you what you already know. And also I'm going to draw a free, well, I don't know if I'm going to draw a free body diagram, even though I haven't talked about free body diagrams yet. Anyway, so there's kinetic friction. It, it, it is involved when there is relative motion between the two surfaces. And so here is the very simple example where you have a three kilogram mass. It is being pushed to the right and it is moving to the right at, uh, with eight, uh, the push is 8.5 newtons and you're given the coefficient of kinetic friction equal to 0.25 and you're asked to find the acceleration. Uh, this is really just uh, almost everything that's interesting is happening in the x direction. So it's kind of a scalar problem. And so, uh, but let's just, even though I've, we haven't done free body diagrams yet, let's just have a look. We have got mg, so 3g acting down, 3 times 9.81 acting up, and we've got, uh, you know what, I shouldn't put the letters, I'll just put the letters in, mg acting down, and then that is the contact force Fn uh, between the two surfaces, and I think you know that uh, the friction force is going to act parallel to the surface it's going to oppose the motion. And I also think that you know that it is equal to mu k times this contact uh, force Fn. Books call that force capital N, but then it gets confusing with the Newtons, the N of the Newtons. So I try to remember to call it Fn. So if we want to do the, uh, uh, if we want to find Ax, uh, we have the sum of the forces in the x direction is P minus mu k, uh, mu k Fn is equal to Max. So this is 8.5 minus 0.25 times 3 times 9.81 is equal to 3 times the acceleration in the x direction and Ax is equal to 0 0.38 meters per second squared. Any questions about that? Because I think you know all that. All right, just let me check my notes, see if I haven't forgotten anything. Opposes relative motion. Oh, yeah, interesting that, uh, that this friction force does not depend upon the speed or even the acceleration between the two bodies. It only depends on that contact force and 
the material properties, the stickiness of the surfaces that's reflected in that constant. Question. Oh, uh, usually you don't include units at this point. You certainly include units for your answer. Sometimes you might want to do a separate unit check, but you don't usually, when you're doing intermediate calculations, carry your units through every step. Right? All right. Static. All right, there are two things to uh, remember about static friction. Number one is that your static coefficient of friction is, uh, in general and almost always, practically greater than mu k. They are not the same. In fact, once you get moving, it becomes easier to continue the motion. So a surface, a surface is less sticky once you get the motion started. So that's why mu s n is greater than uh, mu k in general. I'm sure we could find some sort of idealized case where they were the same, but it's pretty rare. And the second important thing to remember about static friction is that the friction force equal to mu s fn is almost always wrong. Okay, I have a demonstration about this, and it requires a volunteer, and it requires a volunteer uh, with a proviso. This volunteer cannot be embarrassed when I ask them how much they weigh. Okay? Anybody, anybody want to volunteer? Sure. This gentleman here. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so I need you to provide FN. Uh, 150 kilograms. Okay, what, 150 kilograms? Really? Okay, I'll go 170. Uh, kilograms? Oh, uh, not kilograms. <laughs> okay, I usually wait until you're up here. Now, listen, be careful, because you don't want to step here, because that will cause a trouble. Okay, you want to, you know, there. So you want to step there, I want you to step there. Yes. There we go. Is that, is that, you know what, I'm going to shift you. Over just a little bit. There you are. Because you're over the base. I don't want you know to tip the table. All right. Now I'm going to ask you how much you weigh. Uh, well, 170 pounds. Ah, oh, thank you. I didn't think you weighed 150 kilograms. <laughs> I'm pretty dense. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What did you say? 170 pounds? So how many kilograms is that? I have no clue. Okay, so that's about uh, uh, 70, 75 kilograms? Perfect. 75 kilograms. All right, so 75 kilograms means, back of the envelope now, I'm, I'm not going to do the calculation. So 75 means 750 newtons. Gravity is exerting 750 newtons on you in the downward direction and 750 newtons is being exerted on you by the table in the upper direction so you don't accelerate anywhere, okay? So therefore, Fn, Fn is 750 newtons. And us, you know, this is a fairly smooth table. I brought along my little plastic disc here for him to stand on, otherwise I would be pushing boots. Uh, and so that's a fairly smooth surface, so let's say that mu s is 0.3. So let's see, uh, Fn is 750 and, and mu s is 0.3.
So mu s f n is 225 newtons, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Is that right? Can you do that in your head? That's okay. Okay, so, so mu s n is in fact, in this circumstance, is equal to 225 newtons, correct? You agree with that? Yeah. Okay, what's the static friction force right now? It's zero. It's zero. So it's certainly not equal to mu s f n. I think it's zero right now. Okay. I am now going to come along and with my finger, I'm going to push this disc with an amount of force in the horizontal direction, one newton. How much is the static friction force now? One. It's one newton. It really is. All right. I'm going to come along and I'm going to push this with five newtons. <laughs> How much is the static friction force now? You get the point. One is not equal to mu s f n, and five is not equal to mu s f n. Now I'm going to come along. I'm going to push with 224 newtons. 224 newtons. <laughs> How much was the static friction force then? 224 newtons. Now I'm going to push with 226 newtons. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> using UK. Okay? So, in general, you've seen, by way of example, that very rarely is the static friction force equal to mu s f n. There is only one general category of occasion when mu s f n is the static friction force. And that is not in real life. It is, in fact, in first year problem sets. <laughs> or on first year tests. Or on first year final exams. But if the friction force is going to be equal to mu s f n, there's always going to be a clue. And the clue is going to go like this. Uh, calculate the force that you can exert on this mass uh, 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 so that it is on the verge of moving. Okay. What is the maximum force you can exert without having the mass move? Okay. When you get an expression like that, then you, when you are doing your problem set or your test question, you can make the assumption that, you, uh, that the friction force is in fact the maximum friction force, I should write that down, that uh, mu s f n is in fact the maximum available friction force. So f f static max is equal to the mu s f n. And that only occurs just before it becomes a kinetic problem. So Professor Young is going to do a problem for you next week. And the word, one of the words in the problem is going to be maximum. And I want you to be able to recognize the significance of that word when you come across it. Okay. All right, let us just have a look at this problem because when I did this problem, we were talking about kinetic friction, and I in fact told you that it was moving. Let's go back, let's have the same mass, 
we'll have the same uh, we'll have the same mass. We'll have the same 8.5. We'll have uh, not only the kinetic coefficient of friction, but the static coefficient of friction. And we'll set up the problem, but I'm not going to give you that initial piece of information. I'm not going to tell you whether it is moving or not. Let's find out if it's going to move. So here's our free body diagram, mg fn. There's our friction force, just F sub F, and there's our P. And we know there is some friction. We know there is some friction, but we don't know whether it is static or kinetic friction, because I haven't told you whether it's moving or not. So the way that one deals with these problems is you've got to decide that right at the beginning. And so you check, and the way you check is you look, you, you assume it's not moving. So you assume that A is equal to zero, which means that we're in statics, which means that the friction force is equal and opposite to P, which means that that's going to be 8.5 newtons. The question is, do I have 8.5 newtons available to me? You see, in my, in my demonstration, I had 225 newtons available to me. Okay, and when, when it was available to me, and then once I went over it, then it became a kinetic problem. Okay. So do I have 8.5 newtons available to me, or have I already used up the maximum amount available and it's a kinetic problem? Well, to do that, all we have to do is check the FF max. So FF max is, in fact, equal to mu S Fn which is equal to 0 0.3 times 3 times 9.81. And it turns out that that is equal to 8.8 .8 newtons. So the maximum available is 8.8. .8. I only need 8.5. And so therefore, my assumption that the acceleration is equal to 0 is a correct one. And this is a static problem. Right. Any questions? All right, and uh, now it really looks like I need some board. I'll be right back. All right. <laughs> up by starting with a single mass and a single linear spring. I'll tell you what linear means in a minute. It's on a horizontal surface and this little icon of the wheels just means that there's no friction there. So in fact, uh, once we start to have a motion of, ma of the mass in response to some forces, we are going to be interested in tracking where it is. And so we need to look at this mass at its location along the x-axis. I've set it up as a purely scalar problem okay, along the x-axis. So we need a scale and we need an origin. And I have actually made a point with my own class that one can put an origin wherever one wants. Uh, but usually there's a, an origin that makes things easier okay, or makes more sense. 
And this is what this is one that's this this origin is particularly true in this sense. In fact, it's it, it would be a mistake to define your origin in any place other than the location that the mass is when the spring is not exerting any force on the mass. So in fact, uh, this is a dimensionless mass, but let's, let's just, it's, it's particle sized. But let's call that equal x, let's call that location on the floor x equals zero, and uh, we will call the right hand the positive direction. So this is uh, a case where Fs, that is the force that the spring exerts on the mass, is equal to zero, and the spring is at its natural length. And the common uh, notation for the natural length of the spring is L sub naught. Okay, L naught. All right, so that's fairly uninteresting, and we're back at Civ 100 for that diagram, so let's change things. And in fact, we're going to move the mass to some different location. Wall. There's my x equals zero. Remember, the scale is on the floor. The scale is stuck on the floor. That's still the positive direction. But here, we're going to move our mass out here. And so that spring has stretched. Okay, and I'm going to look at this case now. Now, for this to happen, there are actually two forces that are being exerted on the mass. Okay. There's my hand that is pulling it out and letting it rest there, and then there's the spring force that is acting on it. I'm interested in the spring force. I'm not interested in the hand force at the moment. Okay. So I'm interested in the spring force. The spring force. Now, the spring force, remember I mentioned this was a linear spring? Okay, it's the simplest kind of, of spring, but it's not unrealistic. Lots of real life springs are linear. What that means is that the force that's going to be exerted on this mass is going to be linear with the displacement x. So we have displaced that mass an amount x meters stretch the spring by an amount x meters more than its natural length. And the spring force is going to be linear with that. And the constant of proportionality is the k. The constant of proportionality is the k. The k reflects, you know, what the thickness of the wire and the number of coils and the diameter of the coils, all those physical things about the spring. So that's the spring constant, and so this force uh, that is exerted on the mass is linear with x, so it's x k times x. Does anyone see anything wrong? Let's uh, draw a free body diagram here to see if there's anything wrong. So there's a hand, but the spring force, that's a stretched spring. What's the sign of x? x is positive, fs is negative. Got to be. Got to be. All right. Let's now look at the third case. Same wall, same x equals zero. Now let's use our hand that we're not interested in to move our mass some amount x there. And our spring has gotten compressed. All right, and again, I'm interested in the force that the spring is exerting on the mass. Fs, again, it's linear. So it's going to be linear with that displacement. 
and it's going to be linear with the physical features of the spring. All right, let's, uh, let's just uh, do the free body diagram thing again. Because here's my mass, and yes, the hand, the hand is there. But what's the spring doing? The spring is pushing. Hmm. What's x? What's the sign of x? The sign of x is negative. It's, I moved it minus three centimeters. I moved it minus three centimeters. I know it's scalar, okay? It's not vector. It's scalar, but it's mi plus minus is still important. So x is in fact negative. That number is negative. That number is positive. The answer has got to be positive. So the force that the spring exerts on the mass is minus kx, regardless of whether you are extending or compressing the spring. That's very important. Now, the signs are important here. I'm just going to give you a little preview heads up. Uh, as things get more complicated uh, in uh, in problem solving for this course, there are going to be springs around. And sometimes they're not going to be on the x-axis. Sometimes they're going to be at an angle. OK, they might be moving around. But, and so it's very important and particularly easy when you're dealing with a spring to check the physics, to check the physics. If the spring is compressed, then the force on the mass will be pushing away from the spring, aligned with the spring. You know, so don't worry if your spring is at an angle or your motion is at an angle. That spring force is going to be aligned with the spring. If, if the spring is compressed, the force will act uh, pushing the mass. And if the spring is extended past its natural length, then it will be pulling backwards again along the line of the spring. So I always encourage my students to rely on the physics, to check their work, to check their understanding. Uh, but it's particularly easy and particularly important when you're dealing with springs. Any questions? Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm finding this with my own class that I'm moving more quickly than I'm used to moving. And I want to give you your money. Right? So I thought that if I was here with an extra five minutes, I would show you an engineering marvel. This is an engineering marvel. I mean, this is really, I mean, really, 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 really. My gloves. Okay, my gloves. Like, really, look at this. Look at these gloves. Look at these. I, they're a little grubby, because, you know, I've been wearing them. But look at these gloves. Huh. They've got four fingers on each of them. And a thumb <laughs> that's in a different location. Right? Like it's opposite. And the left thumb is different from the right thumb. Right? Like it's a mirror pair. So they're two different gloves. And they're four colors. I think they're five colors. One, two, three, four. They're five colors. Five. In that, I want you to think like an engineer. I want you to think about making these gloves. They're knitted. Five fingers, opposing thumb, five colors. They're lined. They're lined, right? There's a little different ribbing there next to my wrist, like a different stitch, right? Amazing, right? Two dollars and ninety-nine cents. And folks. That's not about cheap labor. Labor. That's, that's about. It's some. It's somewhat about cheap labor, but it's mostly. But it's mostly about machine design. I'll see you next Friday.